Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar organized by the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. My name is Ruzbe Parsi. I head the Middle East and North Africa program. And we are doing this in cooperation and collaboration with our colleagues in the Global Politics and Security program. This seminar is about the future of Syria, prospects for justice, peace and reconciliation. And we have three distinguished panelists who are going to help us try and understand and navigate this very tragic and thorny issue, uh, the ongoing civil war in Syria and what can be done in order to conceive something that looks like justice and peace. The panelists are in the order of their appearance uh, in the initial round of presentations. Aron Lund, researcher at Totalforsvars Forskningsinstitut here in Stockholm and fellow at the Century Foundation. Dr. Johanna Managrian Selimovic, associate professor in peace and development research at the School of Social Sciences at Sedaton University and also senior associate research fellow here at UI. Last but not least, Laila al odat MENA Director at Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Welcome to all of you. We have an hour to try and get into this issue. Uh, and so I'm going to ask Aaron first to give us a lay of the land uh, where we stand at the moment uh, in terms of the civil war and, and the power relations, which are whether one likes it or not, the, one of the frameworks that we have to uh, relate to when trying to understand what can be done. Aaron, please. All right. Thank you for having me and, and um, happy to be here. Uh, so in, in, uh, in five to seven minutes, uh, <laughs> Syria is a big, big topic to cover. And I should start by saying that I'm no, by no means an expert on, on transitional justice. But I think that in insofar as transitional justice requires a transition, the outlook is pretty bleak. But I think the, the panelists will probably cover that aspect of it as well. Uh, Syria, the war has, or the crisis has been ongoing for, for almost 10 years now, or for it, the, it, the, the 10th anniversary is coming up now in March. And uh, it's been one of the most devastating wars, civil wars in, in contemporary history. Uh, hundreds, hundreds of thousands killed. We have no definite number for the number of killed, but the estimates range from 200 to perhaps 500 or even more uh, thousand people. Half of the population, more than half of the population has been displaced, either within Syria or as refugees outside of the country. Uh, approximately 6 million refugees have fled to neighboring countries, primarily Turkey uh, or to the European Union or, or elsewhere in the world. And as we know, uh, tens of thousands of people remain disappeared inside Syria, whether after arrest by government forces or, or other uh, actors, rebel groups, uh, Islamic State, uh, other jihadis, Kurdish forces, or, or others, and uh, there's there's um, uh, just been a lot of, of tragedy and trauma to go around in Syria. Uh, with all that said, uh, the conflict at this point doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, the war has been more or less stalemated uh, since the intervention, gradually from. 2013-14 to 2016 by foreign nations. Uh, you had uh, Iran went into Syria in, in different forms in between 2013 and 2015. Um, you had uh, the United States entered Syria to fight the Islamic State in, in, uh, in 2014. You had uh, Russia came in in 2015, Turkey went in across the border in 2016, and this is not to mention the, the proxy war aspect of the conflict as well. So you had all these foreign interventions and you now have uh, Syria divided essentially between, between um, these nations or rather their clients inside Syria, Russia and Iran backing up the Syrian government, uh, the United States backing up primarily the Syrian Democratic Forces, a uh, Kurdish-led uh, organization in the northeast of Syria, and Turkey backing up a, a motley crew of rebels and, and Islamist groups in mainly in northwestern Syria. And the main, I would say, the main reason that this has stalemated war it has to do not with any um, slackening of, of, of the thirst for bloodshed, but rather uh, 
the, the fact that these nations involved uh, have de-conflicted their forces in various ways through agreements with each other so that the Russian, uh, Russian Air Force does not want to, to get into a fight with the US Air Force or with Turkey um, because that would have uh, implications that reach far beyond Syria. And these deconfliction deals uh, that ended up as being more or less a political agreements for the security and safety and, and operations of, of their respective forces have, in the end, led to the freezing of the Syrian conflict since about 2018. There's been there's been a number of flare-ups since then, and there will probably more, be more of them in the future. But the broad outlines or the contours of the Syrian uh, serious de facto partitioning actually is, is uh, they're already there. Uh, I'm not saying that this is necessarily a, a permanent situation or that it will be a stable situation. It's certainly not a, a, um, a, a normal or peaceful situation, but that's where we are right now. And, and I think until there is a, a fundamental change in policy on the part of either the United States or Turkey or Russia, then we will see some version of this uh, continuing or until there is some unexpected major rupture in the conflict for other reasons, for internal reasons. And we've seen that happen in the past with, with um, uh, for example, the rise of the Islamic State in 2013, 2014, which changed the, the nature of the conflict and drew in other players from outside and so forth. So there, there's, uh, there's certainly a lot of things that could still happen. Uh, but the the as far as we can tell, or as far as I can tell, at least, the conflict seems for, more or less uh, frozen in place, with the Syrian government led by Bashar al-Assad still and not reformed in the slightest, still ruling most of the population, most of the country, the major cities and the institutions and so forth, rebel groups of various stripes controlling the northwest and the uh, Syrian democratic forces having proclaimed an autonomous region in, in the northeast. Um, there are, of course, peace talks uh, via the UN in Geneva. Uh, currently, they focus on the uh, uh, on constitutional reform, on the idea that you'd reform the constitution, then you'd hold elections, and then, of course, everything will will, will pan out beautifully after that. But the uh, but the peace talks they don't seem to be going anywhere. Um, the main reason there's a number of reasons for that, but the main reason is that the um, Syrian government is simply not interested in in these peace talks because they're not simply peace talks about having a peace deal, they're talks about having a transition. That's the built-in uh, uh, idea of the, since, since the UN process got going in 2012, the idea has always been to have a political transition. Now Bashar al-Assad has made very clear that he doesn't want a political transition. That's why he's been fighting for 10 years. And I don't think there's any reason to believe that he will change his mind on that, uh, regardless of how successful the opposition negotiators are in Geneva. Uh, and frankly, I don't think there's any reason to believe that he will change his mind on that, uh, even if he comes under increasing economic pressure, as, as is the case right now, uh, given that he didn't uh, bend or reform his government or compromise or share power during the years when, when his military situation looked really bleak in the 2012, 2013, 14, 15 period. So the, um, the Syrian government seems very intransigent and the other actors involved with the peace talks in Geneva have very little independent uh, control over matters inside Syria, except in so far as they act as a representative of Turkish interests, which, is, which, which just brings us to the other peace process, uh, uh, which is that. Uh, arranged by Turkey, Iran, and, and Russia in, Gen in uh, sorry in Astana, uh, nowadays called Nur Sultan in, in Kazakhstan, and the Astana process is fundamentally not about a transition. It's about a distribution of power or spheres of influence um, in which Russia, Turkey, and Iran nowadays mostly Russia and Turkey basically hash out their you know their they 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 decide on their their own interests uh, using their Syrian clients and, and just try to settle the conflict that way. And they both seem very comfortable with having this as a as a long term um, unresolved conflict or a, uh, a frozen conflict. We see that with, with Turkey's behavior in in, uh, in Cyprus, for example, and Russia has, uh, you know, Georgia and, and Moldavia and uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, seems very comfortable with, with this type of non-resolution to conflicts. So I think that's 
that's where we're at right now and that's where it's headed, uh, which doesn't make it any less urgent, of course, to discuss issues of trans transitional justice or human rights or other aspects of, of the conflict, because there's certainly a lot to, to discuss. Uh, and um, I think that's, that's my introduction. Thank you, Arun. Uh, obviously, this is a bleak picture. And uh, one of the things that we will then, uh, I would like to get back to is this, let's call it the imperviousness of Assad to that kind of pressure. That is then what can be achieved if you cannot pressure him into any particular track that he doesn't want to go into. But uh, so hold on to that question, please. Johanna, um, you have co-authored uh, a paper that will be published soon uh, at UI on transitional uh, justice and reconciliation in the Syrian conflict. Would you like to tell us a bit about the paper and, and both method and, and content? Thank you, Rospo, and thank you, Arden, for this uh, opening to this, um, this seminar. And I think it's, uh, maybe I should just start by saying that I'm for quite some time been working with the uh, topics to do with transition and justice and reconciliation and so on in, in other parts of the world, like in Bosnia, Rwanda, South Africa, and so on. And I think um, we are slowly having to adjust to the idea that many conflicts do not end, like, you know, you make the transition from war to peace, but you end up in this kind of sort of gray zone, as Arjan was telling us about. Um, and when it comes then to transitional justice as a mechanism, how do we then think about that in relation to this kind of gray, <clears throat> gray zone of no war, no peace, so to speak. And this is what me and Ashi al um, sat down and thought about, and we have then produced this report that's just in the pipeline. Uh, and I want to share a PowerPoint, so that, give me just a second. Aaron, considering that, as you mentioned, and as I said, uh, we're partly dealing with someone who has managed somehow to dodge all the bullets, almost literally, um, Bashar al-Assad, what are the chances or what interest do you see, for instance, from the new Biden administration in, in trying to change tack or try something different with regards to the Syrian conflict? Is it of any interest to them? Uh, it's a good question. I think there's certainly going to be some interest in changing tack for the Trump administration because the Trump administration effectively made Syria policy an offshoot of Iran policy. He tried to use Syria to get at Iran. And that doesn't seem to be something the Biden administration will be as interested in. Uh, but that said, I, I'm not sure exactly what do they change back to, because the Obama policy is, you know, whatever you think of it, it's, it's, it's outdated now. It's, no, that, that, it's not no longer relevant. You have to find a new, a new position, figure out new goals, figure out what means to apply to reach those goals. And I think they have a lot of thinking to do. And it's not clear to me what tack they'll choose. You see the, the appointments uh, that Biden has made so far seem to you know, include people that have been both um, sort of hawkish on Syria and, and people have been dovish or wanting to sort of scale back uh, US efforts. So there's, there's both, both sides there, I think. And OK, okay now I see the, the PowerPoint. Very good. Thank you. You can see the now, PowerPoint. Now, Yes. Oh, wonderful. Let me just start to. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Some, some things happen sometimes. No worries. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, we, me and uh, Ashley al then uh, put together this report. Um, and it, well, what we do is um, with the, we raise the questions that are, of course, very pertinent in relation to Syria. Is it possible to address crimes in the midst of conflict? Um, can victims' needs be seen to? And can indeed justice come before peace? And in order to try to answer these questions, then we, we looked at Syria and we tried to do a first kind of mapping of the efforts that we found. And so we found that there are actually quite a few different initiatives going on, initiatives that do have the impact on the conflict, we think, and also impacts on the field of transitional justice. And so let me just uh, then go through and bring up some of well, let me first just say then what is transitional justice that so you might not, everyone who's uh, watching this might not be so familiar. So really we think about three different aspects of transitional justice. One has to do with accountability, putting perpetrators, giving them the, the kind of punishment um, that they need. Acknowledgement has to do with the uh, victims uh, that they get um, 
the truth comes out, what happened to them and so on. Reparations has to do with more material aspects, usually. Uh, so what you lost during the conflict, you would get a chance to sort of get that back. So then when we looked at Syria, we could see several different types of criminal justice. Well, first of all, um, the International Criminal Court and National Courts are yeah, I mean, we have to see them as a sort of dead end at this moment in order to reach criminal justice because, um, well, first of all, Syria has not ratified uh, the Rome Statute of the ICC. National courts is just inside the country impossible. Um, so what we've seen then is this innovative use of international jurisdiction. Uh, so this is what allows states to prosecute individuals for war crimes and crimes against humanity outside of Syria. So we've seen trials in Germany, in Sweden, Norway, and so on. And we have seen how these transnational networks of activists, scholars, uh, lawyers, and so on, collaborate in order to make this, these um, trials happen. So there are still just a few of them, but it's an indication that this is a, a different kind of path to take. Um, then another aspect, which is quite interesting when it comes to uh, the Syrian war, is documentation. And of course, documentation is central for so many aspects of transitional justice. Um, um, and there are many, I would say, probably millions of documents from like films, filmed with mobile phones to various types of documents and, and photos and so on. Um, and of course, this is so important for trials, but also for acknowledgement and for reparation. We have also seen that through the digital de developments that we can use YouTube um, videos, for example, and that people from all over the world can then crowdsource in order to collect this information. So this is really important. And it's been stated by other people before us that this kind of documentation is not only for the future as a sort of archive, but it's also a form of non-violent resistance that goes on in the midst of conflict. Because when you do collect this, this documentation, you, you, you sort of, you protest against propaganda, you protest against uh, the marginalization of certain victims and so on. Another aspect that we looked at is the role of art when it comes to memorialization. Art has, since the very beginning of the conflict, has been a really important aspect of resistance. Um, graffiti, mu murals, but other types of art, poetry, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, art connected to memorialization means that you, you create a site in, in the country of conflict in order to mourn, to um, gather around and so on. But when the conflict is ongoing, you can't have that space. So instead, we see these digital spaces being formed. Uh, and I just want to give one example, which is this creative memory, uh, creative memory platform, I think it's called. Um, and I really uh, you know, encourage you to go there and, and, and um, surf around and, and look at all the incredible artwork that's there. And we can see this as then as a digital archive um, to ensure uh, that these um, there are also documents and memories that, that are then be becoming part of a sort of shared identity and a shared uh, collective memory. Finally, then very briefly, then reparations. Reparations becomes really important in the case of Syria. I mean, in most conflicts, but in, in particular, we can see here with so many millions of refugees, displaced persons, and all this massive material destruction, which then is also part of this enforced demographic change that when it comes to getting back your house, your land, your property and so on becomes incredibly important. And again, here we can see that um, when you can't find this, uh, you know, by going to the, to the local housing office or whatever, uh, there are these other innovative sources of documentation, for example, marking your property at Wikimapia, combining that with drawings, with phot photographs and so on. Um, okay, so all of these points we can get back to. I just wanted to give an, an overview now and then reach some sort of conclusions when it comes to timing, actors and spaces. And these are conclusions that are really important in the case of Syria, but I would say as a, you know, with experience from other conflicts, uh, this is something that we can bring with us uh, in our uh, future studies as well.
So when it comes to timing, we can see it's possible to start transitional justice processes before there is a settlement. And we can see that by doing that, we find these new paths towards accountability, acknowledgement and reparations. And there is then a possibility to actually sort of kickstart the peace process, even while the conflict is ongoing. And this also means that there is a plethora of actors who are involved in this process, both the diaspora, which is really important, obviously, and Syrians still living in Syria. And of course, the challenge is to make uh, cooperation between these sort of two groups that might have quite different uh, points of departure and possibilities to engage. And just a couple of examples of how the spaces of transition justice change, how trials can happen in other spaces, but also how this kind of uh, use of digital spaces has meant that transitional justice has become sort of deterritorialized. And all of this, I think, is really important when it comes to peace and justice and reconciliation in Syria and beyond Syria. So thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving us uh, both a broad and, and deep uh, view of, of the paper and the research that you and Ashi have conducted. Now, this, of course, raises a number of questions. You pointed to some of them yourself. One of the crucial ones being what kind of uh, both conceptual but also practical relationship do we have between peace and justice? That is, can you have not perfect, but at least a lot of justice without first having peace? Uh, or are they in some kind of conflict or maybe they're not? This is something that I think uh, we need to discuss, especially in ongoing conflicts. Um, another aspect which I find interesting is of course time. Basically what you're pointing to and Ashi uh, is that this is something that is contemporaneous. This is synchronized with what, when it is still happening. Unlike, as you pointed out, you know, both the museums and, and the white books and whatnot that tend to come after everything has been settled one way or another. But it also points to the importance not only of timing, but uh, the passage of time. I mean, if we look at the transitions in South America, for instance, those were partly possible because they basically let the perpetrators get away with it, if you will, right? So transition to democracy was partly at least requiring that we did not pursue justice with the perpetrators immediately because otherwise they would not relinquish power. Then a decade or so later, the constitutions can be revised to remove all those provisions that allow the perpetrators to, to get away with things. And then you can delayed uh, serve some justice. Obviously not as satisfactory, but, but better than nothing would be one argument. Or can it be done much closer to the point of the crime, so to speak? So this would be uh, something to, to I, I would like to, to hear your, your uh, views on. Laila, um, Johanna has been pointing to some of the efforts being made uh, also in the diaspora, very crucial, the ability of people not only to, to flee, but also to find venues, places and instruments and institutions to, to help them recreate some kind of basis for political activity beyond the borders of, of the, the war, so to speak, the war zone. Uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about what this looks like from the ground up, so to speak? Yes, sure. Thank you, Rospe. Um, and thanks to you, Hannah and Aaron, for the um, uh, very interesting um, points made. Um, the diaspora has played an important role um, as part of a lot of nonviolent activism that took place to achieve peace and justice in Syria, uh, despite the limited spaces available for all nonviolence, let alone the ones that are being done by communities far away from where the action is happening. And it, predominantly um, uh, disadvantaged by being away from, uh, from home. Uh, so the diaspora is disadvantaged and on so many levels and that's only one of them. However, that um, still manifested in consistent and sustainable efforts to address these injustices uh, through a lot of what Johanna mentioned of documentation, of memorization, of identifying certain aspects of the harm, of pursuing 
um, justice and accountability, whether through its punitive form uh, or through its restorative form. Um, and, uh, and also by advocacy, a lot of advocacy has been done by Syrians in, in exile and in the diaspora over the, um, over the period of the past 10 years and before, and will I'm sure continue to happen. It also manifested in efforts for um, humanitarian support, uh, lobbying governments of states where they are in, um, and taking direct action. So one of the examples which link justice to the work of the diaspora is the fantastic work uh, that's being done by families of the victims and those who um, are trying to highlight the impact on their loved ones, on themselves, and to take direct action uh, towards the peace process, towards the justice process, um, in an effort to bring victims and their families together and to have an active role and have a say in how the process is happening. And what's very interesting about their role is that they're combining both short-term and long-term efforts and a lot of the efforts across the world across the world by families of uh, victims have an existential question of if, if we lobby for short-term gains for those displaced sorry for those disappeared or for those in detention as we speak are we um, creating legitimacy for those who are committing human rights violations against them? Do we actually want to speak to those who are uh, depriving them from their liberty? I think what these groups have done very smartly is combining both um, strategies together. So on the short term, they're saying, our loved ones shouldn't be detained, they shouldn't be disappeared. All of this should be dismantled and addressed through a long term transformative peace process. However, until that happens, and we will continue to work for that to happen, but until it happens, we would like direct um, results um, of this lobbying. So we would like to know where they are, to know their faith, to get their documents, to uh, increase, to uh, 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 improve the situation in detention centers and so on. So I think the combination, the tactical combination of these long-term and short-term um, efforts has been very important. And it also addresses what Aaron has referred to that although the conflict is prolonged, it doesn't look like there is a, a massive change that's gonna happen soon. However, it's still unsustainable. The current situation of the Assad regime is not sustainable. They cannot stay on at this um, interaction forever. It has to change. And these efforts by those advocates are pushing to give uh, suggestions and possibilities for breaking this stalemate, um, either through uh, putting putting some uh, proposals for the transitional justice uh, process or for the peace process, for empowering those who actually made it to the table with options of what could be done to uh, break this stalemate, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, one of the things I know uh, you particularly been looking at and which is of a high relevance here is of course the gender aspect and the fact that none of this like in any conflict none of it none of none of the things that happen happen to everyone equally because we're not dealing with a pre-existing equal situation and therefore it cannot then uh, uh, impact everyone equally would you like to say something about that as well Sure, thank you. Um, you're absolutely right. These violations don't happen in a vacuum. So they impact different people differently and they're highly gendered. So um, some of the um, violations that took place in Syria uh, have a huge disproportionate and grave impact um, on women. And this should be, I'd argue that this should be addressed and should be accounted for, documented and built in within any transitional justice process. Otherwise, it will, not be, um, it will not be equitable, it will not be fair, it will not contribute to building peace, sustainable peace, rather than just a succession of hostilities. I'll give you a few examples about how the gendered um, aspect of the harm endured by, um, by different groups in Syria. So for example, as Aaron mentioned, there's a, there has been an extensive use of um, explosive weapons in highly populated areas. Um, in Syria. That's a 
and that's the signature of the of the regime for many years. And these are incredibly gendered. They caused so so a research showed that between 2011 and 2014, they caused 53 percent of the civilian death. Um, death falling from the sky. However, they killed 74% of women. Um, it's telling us that first they, um, they target civilian, uh, they target civilian um, areas, they aim at targeting livelihood, uh, they aim at targeting medical centers and uh, uh, make it harder for those who are uh, making use of them to sustain their livelihood. So they might not die with the bombardment, but their livelihood will be severely impacted later on by the, by the results of it. Also, for example, the significant use of besiegement over the years was incredibly gendered due to the underlying socioeconomic inequalities due to the gender roles. And um, that meant that women have suffered entirely differently and their suffering will continue uh, even after the violation itself ends. We know that, for example, in Syria, there has been a huge weaponization and monopolization of the government of this of the Assad's regime role as a as a gov government, functional or not. So their monopolization of people's documents, well, half of the country is displaced either internally or externally. That means that um, people could not register birth, death marriages, divorces, inheritance, and so on. And when the pre-existing conditions is that inheritance is not equal, is that women are entirely dependent um, uh, on, um, on having these proof to access their livelihood, to access their uh, financial independence and so on. That's hugely problematic and it continues to be a problem. And a lot of the refugees are held hostage by the fact that they cannot um, access their documentation uh, and they continue to do so. And unfortunately, we still don't have a solution to that because it's still monopolized by regime, even if half of the world does not acknowledge their sovereignty or their um, rightful uh, role as the head of the state. And um, so, uh, and lastly, I just want to comment on a point that Johanna has rightly raised, the issue of property and land rights and the monopolization of that. We know that there has been a consistent policy of um, confiscating land of those both as a, a way of in law, in increasing the Assad regime monopolization and access to people's land, but also to penalize those who flee, to penalize ho those who uh, uh, have been part of the political dissent and so on. This has been hugely problematic for women if we look at the pre-existing inequalities. So a research took place of the refugee community in Lebanon, of a certain refugee community in Lebanon, and which comes mainly from rural areas. And while 50% of women refugees there um, have spent have been working in farming when they were in Syria, only four of them have any right of ownership to farm or land or property. That means that their access to their livelihood is entirely dependent on their situation in the family and on their dependence on usually the men who have the possession and the right to that property. When the conflict has changed all of that, it means that the men might not might no longer be there, but also women's status in the family might not be the same. They might not be in that marriage that allowed them to access their husband's family, uh, their husband's land, um, or they might not have the male link to that access. So that will result in huge feminization of poverty, in their denial of their livelihood, It and, and if they end up being uh, heads of households without access to the land, that's, they're just distant to destitute and poverty for a very long time. So based on this, and obviously there's, a lot of examples on all of that. So I'd argue that exactly what Johanna said about the need of a transitional justice, but that also needs to be transformative. We cannot restitute people to where they were before the past 10 years of conflict without addressing the huge inequalities before that 
last, what I look at as the last episode of violence and conflict, because Syria was not heaven before that at all. Um, so we cannot just address that last episode without um, addressing the underlying inequalities. And transitional justice in itself, although very hard, can have a transformative impact. Reparations that Johanna mentioned um, have a proven um, uh, they, they're proven to have that kind of transformative impact. But for that to happen, we need to first have a gendered, um, a gendered way of looking at the harm. We need to know how do we identify a victim? Because if you only look at one kind of victimization, if we only count the number of dead, uh, or if we only look at those who are tortured without looking at the impact of that on those around them, we will not understand the gendered impact. And we will design reparation programs that are not gendered, that are not transformative, and that would not work for most. Um, for most uh, people. And um, it's also important that these are set up in an inclusive way. And um, civil society in Syria has provided fantastic example, both on documentation as, as has just been mentioned, but also on including bigger communities in the design and implementation of policies. This should be uh, formalized it should be at the center of any transitional justice process, and it should take um, place in a way that uh, taking the transformative nature of these processes into account. Um, and when we manage to start achieving this, we will take a step to remedy the harm, but also to um, address uh, any inequalities, and also hopefully to transform and reform institutions and powers and processes that has led to the underlying inequality and also to the way that the harm endured in the last episode of the past 10 years has taken place. Thanks. Very good. Um, so just want to remind the audience that if you want to ask questions, you can do that via Zoom, but also via the Facebook uh, page where we are broadcasting this. Um, the things that you've all pointed to and the questions that I pose to, to all of you uh, inevitably leads us also to a conversation about power relations, both the power relations that existed before the conflict began, the power relations that deformed society throughout the conflict, but also the power relations with the surrounding environment, if you will, which is what you addressed in the beginning, Aaron. To what extent is it then possible to imagine, as someone has asked, for instance, what can the EU do to help uh, any kind of process towards both de-escalation, as in peace of some kind, or at least an absence of outright war, uh, and at the same time, anything that looks like uh, uh, reconciliation and transitional justice? Ara, why don't you quickly start us off and, and then I'll hand it over to Johanna. Quickly. Um, yeah, so what, what the EU can do is, is um, I think that's a question of what the EU wants to do and I'm not sure the EU really knows what it wants to do with Syria at this point. Uh, the EU has, like the United States, but to a different, in a different setup, uh, wedded itself to the idea that Assad has to go, but we're not going to put any military pressure on him to do so. Uh, which I think is a is a non it's a it's a ridiculous idea. It's not going to happen. Whether you want think it's a good idea that he should be pressured out of power or not, it's it's just not happening. Uh, so, does the EU have potential leverage over the regime and over countries involved in the conflict on Assad's side or or neighboring countries and so forth? Absolutely, the EU is a, 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 a one of the major or the major uh, contributor of aid to Syria and to the surrounding countries. The EU has. Uh, trade relations that could be important. There are sanctions to, to play with. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, but I think as long as these uh, issues are bound up with the idea of a transition where, where uh, that, that just isn't happening uh, given the current balance of power, then I think that it's not gonna get anywhere. Uh, I think the EU could constructively work on issues such as, well, aid, I already mentioned that, refugees, there's certainly a great deal of resistance in the EU today to receiving more refugees given what happened in 2015, but you could still work on the margins of that issue and, and have more of an impact than you do today. Um, the documentation issue that Lila mentioned is hugely un important, hugely underreported because it's, you know, how do you, how do you sell to the media that you need to do reports about 
missing ID cards, or missing property deeds. It, it doesn't work, uh, but it's enormously important for refugees inside Syria, for, for displaced people, for even for people who are not displaced and for the people who fled Syria. Uh, and I think that's some, some that's an issue where the EU could offer support in various ways. And you also have the, uh, the issue of, uh, of sanctions, primarily the US sanctions now, but EU sanctions as well. Uh, given the economic collapse in Syria right now that we're seeing, which is for a number of reasons, not just sanctions, it's also the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's Lebanon's banking crisis, it's the war primarily, of course. But given that we're now seeing the, the, the World Food Programme uh, reported just the other day that 60% of Syria's population is now food insecure, that just the, these, these numbers are catastrophic and spiking. Um, there is an urgent need, I think, to listen to the... Uh, humanitarian NGOs that work in Syria that say that we need some, you know, whether you're going to have these sanctions or not, we need some specific changes to make sure that it doesn't stop humanitarian work, it doesn't affect civilian legitimate trade and so forth. And those reforms uh, are, are pretty urgent at this point. And that's something where the EU could, could have an impact. But I think, as I said, the, the primary, the first thing the EU should do is try to figure out what does it want to do with Syria. Uh, and and that, that should be the starting point. Yeah, because, I mean, let me play the devil's advocate for a second. Um, in a sense, you can say that Assad has proven again and again that in the chicken race of who cares the least about the Syrian population, he always wins. So the idea that you could somehow pressure him by withholding aid or ignoring him uh, without the population paying the price for it uh, seems to me uh, rather, you know, improbable. So the, so the question then, the blunt question would be, would the EU stomach having some kind of cooperation with Assad in order to save the population of the country? Not from him, but despite him. Well, um, I, I think saying that this is rather implausible that he would, uh, you know, surrender power, share power because he feels sorry for poor people in Syria. <laughs> it's an understatement. It's it's a the idea is bananas. Um, the um, I mean, given what we know, of the regime, th there's just no reason to think that that kind of pressure will have that effect. It might well have the effect that the Syrian government eventually just crumbles, splits. There's internal fissures. It loses power, but. Given that the EU is not looking for that kind of transition, is not looking for a descent into chaos, which is the more likely outcome, um, then the EU would it, it would blink in the last moment. And Assad knows this. He's as you said, he's been playing chicken. He's he's never turning. You know, he's he's willing to go much further than anyone else. The stakes for him are existential. The stakes for the EU are not. Uh, they're high, but they're not existential. So. Um, yes. As to whether the EU would re-engage with Assad. Um, I don't think that's on the table. I don't think even the nations that are most critical of the current EU policy, there's a few of them, um, don't see you know, any great need to invite Assad for a cozy conversation. Um, there are some, I think, that, that, that would like to have some sort of low level contacts and just you know, normalize things a little bit. But I think the, the important thing is to focus on what can be done within you know where there's still common ground you have some nations that would absolutely not want to re-engage with Assad because of what he's done what his government has done during the war but even those nations could probably uh, see some use in in addressing uh, the problematic aspects of sanctions without necessarily lifting sanctions or you know you can you can find that common ground find where you can do some constructive positive change and and get to work on that I think Johanna, this, uh, this is obviously a, 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 a tricky and difficult question, but assuming that we more or less agree on, on this, uh, this framework, as in this is the most realistic scenario for the short term, that whatever happens, happens in the shadow of Assad, because no one seems to be able to dislodge him or, or make him turn different, on a different route, so to speak. Um, how can one pursue transitional justice in the absence of peace? Yeah, I mean, it, it really is a million dollar question. Uh, but I think that first of all, we need to move away from this idea that justice is going to be perfect. 
as a sort of solution, because then it will not happen if we, we if we're sort of waiting for the right moment. And I think that has been an issue when it comes to the peace negotiations. That you know, let's not talk about justice mm. during the negotiations, because which in many ways makes sense. I mean, if you have the perpetrator sitting around the negotiation table, they will not be fond for a solution that includes. Um, you know, putting them away in jail for the rest of their lives, obviously. Uh, so you have to find other paths. And I think that's what we've been seeing in this conflict, how, as Lila points out, civil society, engaging with all kinds of, of various actors in society, really sort of grassroots engagements, can find new paths towards not perfect justice, very imperfect injustice, but still some workings. And I think we also need to be I mean, we've seen in many conflicts these sort of unexpected consequences, that things that you start by pulling one thread will have a sort of larger transformative effect. And I think that's, you know, to sort of say something a little bit more positive. <laughs> and also, I, I just want to reconnect also to what Lila was saying about a gendered analysis. Um, and I find it very important what she's saying. I, I think that we usually, when we talk about gender and conflict, we tend to focus on like sexual violence, for example. I'm not saying that's not important, it's, it's a grave and widespread crime, but also to see how the consequences of the war are very much gendered. And so that's a, a really important in order to, um, to construct a justice that's also sort of more broad and more transformative. Just a quick follow-up on that. Um, so would you conceptualize, and Lila, feel free to, to also jump in on this, would you conceptualize this pursuit of an imperfect justice, which is better than no justice, as moving parallel to peace negotiations or as part of peace negotiations? Because in a sense, we're dealing with different kinds of actors. Those who usually sit around the diplomatic table are representatives of states or armed groups or uh, some such. Uh, while those who are pursuing justice are usually not. They belong to civil society, diaspora groups, and so on. Well, actually, I think I'm going to let Lila, I think you know more about this than me, than I do, but just to sort of say that, um, I mean, we have seen lots of attempts for civil society, women's organizations, and so on, to push to be part of the formal peace negotiations when it comes to Syria. And I think that's one way of including these issues in the actual sort of uh, you know, space of the peace negotiations. But maybe, Lila, you have something more to say about that. Thanks, Johanna. I think the answer to your question really depends on what do we mean when we refer to a peace process. If we're speaking about the succession of hostilities, of managing the conflict, um, then uh, then it's, it's going to be difficult to connect the two. But civil society and lawyers and advocates uh, have been, and human rights defenders have been working for so many years to say that an actual peace, an actual sustainable peace has these efforts for justice at the very heart of it. Um, there isn't going to be anything other than short um, uh, episodes of uh, posing violence unless we address these harms, the, um, the violence and how civilians experience this harm and violence. Uh, so for a long term um, sustainable peace process to, to, to be possible and to, to take part, which is not a line in the sand. It's not going to have. It doesn't. It's not going to have a date, and um, it's more of a longer process. Um, that one will need justice at the at the heart of it. And yes, civil society, civilians will have uh, a big role to play in it. And the transformation that Aaron referred to between the initial Geneva-based peace process, imperfect as it is, but at least that one had many years of attempts by civil society and by civilians and by advocates around the world to make it inclusive and to have uh, both civil society, women, civilians taking part in it. And, and moving that into the Astana process and other processes where it's literally 
the people with more weapons and more territory are, uh, are, are uh, dividing the pie and looking at their own interests has had a huge impact of any prospect of justice. So what we need to do is to go back to a peace process, which is looking at sustainable peace and, and trying to mend that one and making it as inclusive as possible. Very good. Um, I agree. Um, insofar that anyone cares what I think, but um, I think perhaps what I was pointing at a bit earlier when discussing the South American cases is exactly this, that imperfect justice and achieving some kind of armistice, if you will, both literal and figuratively, could be, does not, is not guaranteed, but could be the stepping stone for making everyone step back far enough to be able to have a more restorative and more sustainable uh, justice effort that can lead to a sustainable peace. I mean, I agree with you that just uh, you know dividing up the cake is not sustainable peace, but it seems to me that in the sequence, in the process, individual for each conflict, of course, there are moments where this kind of very crass pragmatism sometimes is necessary in order to just get everyone away from the battlefield. Uh, and then with the long view, which is in no way guaranteed, and that is the bitter aspect of it. Uh, one can see when things have really mellowed down that one can get back to exactly who did what. Mm. Uh, but that is often very difficult to do in the heat of the war itself, because as Johanna pointed out, no one is going to voluntarily retire themselves, uh, not as long as they think they have the guns on their side. But Laila, I have a question here. Uh, Johanna, did you want to come in? Well, uh, just very briefly, I think it's also in that, uh, in relation to what you're saying, Rosby, to realise the enormous value of the documentation efforts and that we have to see that as an archive that's there for a long time to come and justice, you know, can be slow, but yeah. it doesn't mean that it won't, you know, catch up sooner or later. Yeah, oh, that's a very important point. Laila, please. A quick note on that. I agree with you. There need we all. I don't think anyone is deluded into thinking that there's going to be a straightforward, super ethical piece available at this point. So we understand the need for some pragmatism. But I think one important aspect is not to block the way for future, um, mm -hmm. uh, for a better, for a, a future process that's a little bit better. So. Um, as you mentioned, learning from Latin America, from Bosnia and from other places, rushing into granting uh, blanket amnesties would mm. block potential um, issues. And what's really important is to give those who want to fight with nonviolent means uh, the space to do this, to continue to, they will take part in a an imperfect peace if they know that all the efforts in documentation, in communication with, with victims and survivors, in analyzing, would still have hope in the future. But if we cut this hope altogether, we will have an imperfect peace a, and no prospect to justice. And I think that's the worst of, all, of both worlds. Very fair point, very fair point. Um, we have a number of questions. I think I'll, I'll start with one. We'll see how many we can we can go through. Someone asked about children. Uh, we've discussed the gendered aspect, but of course, as in most wars, uh, children are another of one of those groups, cross-sectional, that are uh, most impacted uh, by the kind of massive violence that war uh, involves. Is there anything you would like to say on, on that account, Laila? Well, I'm in no, by no means an expert in children's rights, but I, the way I look at it is that children are a yet a more vulnerable um, version of Syrian civilians who are, are left with no option. Most Syrian civilians in Syria and outside are left with very little options. Uh, they're bearing the brunt of all this conflict. So I, um, I would look at it as a few of the things that Aaron mentioned on direct issues to um, to make things sustainable, to make livelihoods possible and sustainable for people inside and outside Syria. So just having some sort of a legal status where they can access services in diaspora, in, in neighboring countries, um, uh, some level of healthcare, uh, some level of, um, you know, sustainability uh, would have a huge impact on, um, on children. And the other thing is demilitarizing this 
um, the spaces as much as possible. There has been, I know it's, it sounds like an impossible mission, but it's not. We have documented examples of, um, of civil society groups and women groups demilitarizing some of the most heated points in the, in the country. So I think acknowledging that military and arms and the manifestations of them are always bad and trying to address them, whether by addressing the su supply of them to Syria from the outside and the acceptance of them will have a direct impact on children. And the second one is by allowing the groups of civilians to sustain themselves will have a, an, an impact on how, um, on what kind of future the children will have. Thank you. Um, I want to get back to something that was also mentioned in, in among the questions. Sweden, uh, we should of course not get, a, get ahead of ourselves in, in what a small country in, in, the, in the north of Europe can do, but Sweden has often managed to punch above its weight when it comes to more humanitarian efforts with various conflicts. So the question here is, is Sweden playing any kind of role? Can it play a role, both on the political level, but also more importantly, perhaps on, on the issues that you, Johanna and Leila have, have addressed, that is in, in helping civil society groups outside of Syria to, with different kinds of resources and capacity building in order to be able to sustain this kind of transitional justice effort, uh, you know, regardless of all, all the obstacles that, that the Assad government and others may put in their, in their path. But perhaps very quickly, Aaron, can you say anything about Sweden's political role? Does it have one? Could it have one? Um, I, I think we should, uh... It is a very small country <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with being a very small country as long as you understand that you are a very small country. Uh, I, I don't think Sweden will have a, a major role in, in or even a medium role in Syrian serious resolution uh, uh, at all. But in the sense of being part of the EU as in yes. does Sweden try more I mean, than other I, countries? Or I, I don't have a perfect insight into that, or, or much insight at all, actually. But uh, yes, Sweden seems to be very involved in, in, in so far as it can in EU discussions and so forth. And I think, as, as you said, the, there, Sweden does have a large aid budget for a country its size, and it is involved in Syria as well. And I think that's something to, uh, to continue with and to uh, uh, perhaps, uh, in so far as it is possible, to increase that, that support. Uh, not least because there's now a, a rather substantial refugee diaspora of Syrians in Sweden um, for whom this is very important and who I think could also in, in the future be uh, of great use to that aid effort, having the contacts and the language and the, you know, uh, and, and I think that's something to, to build on and use positively. Thank you. Johanna and Laila, very quickly, we don't have much time left, but if you'd like to say a few words about that, Johanna first. Well, I can just say that, I mean, Swedish civil society is giving lots of support to, uh, you know, important sort of focus support to uh, women's rights groups, for example. Uh, so there is an effort. I um, think Lila? Sweden has a, an important role to play. I don't think there's a singular state who will solve the Syria problem. So, uh, but I do think that Sweden has played a, uh, had set some standards and had played a role model in other peace processes, including Yemen, in the way they engage with the special envoys office, in the kind of conditionalities that has been imposed, in bringing a feminist foreign policy into the conversation. So there is a role that could be played. Also, the way that um, the investment the financial and the resources invested. Setting an example is very important. Are these going to be invested in militarization or are they going to be invested in livelihood and in sustaining peace and, as, and, and in working with civil society and so on? So even a small country, but with a large um, role, the way they see their role is really, really important to change the narrative around international engagement in Syria. Thank you very much. And with that positive note, um, despite the otherwise gloomy picture, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights with us and our audience. I'd like to thank Aaron, Johanna, and Laila, and uh, thank you. Goodbye.